Welcome, welcome, patrons. So I've been sorting through my PMs recently, which, side note, please stop asking me about my personal world today. I've actually been, like, streaming the whole dang thing on my streaming channel, so if you're really curious, you can go check it out over there. I don't really want to answer a bunch of questions about a thing that's publicly available. But anyway, I received a PM about blood magic that made me realize I have yet to do a video on the subject. I'll get to the question asked in the PM later in the video, but for now, let's talk about the forbidden school of magic. Blood. History. We know blood magic is an ancient art, so most of its history is really unknown to us at this moment. From modern Thetis, the first real blood mage was Thalcyon, a Neromedian dreamer. Who is Thalcyon is going to be a question in a lot of your minds, but the basic gist that you need to know right now is that he was a king of a nation that was pre tevinter and popularized the worship of the old gods. Where he got the ability is debated. He claimed that he learned from the old god Dumat. Some scholars say it's actually more likely that the ancient elves passed the knowledge on to humans, while others point to the forbidden ones or powerful demons as being the cause when they made deals with humans and stuff like that. Which, for those of you asking at home, if you actually tinfoil theory your way hard enough, you could argue that this is all just one event. The Forbidden Ones are just loose old gods who are both just powerful demons, and that they originated from elven society and could be considered proto-elves themselves. Why I don't particularly buy this theory, I at least want to say that it is plausible. After Thalcyon popularized blood magic, his nation, which later became Tevinter, used it heavily to build its strength and might. Now, due to the violent and cruel nature of blood magic rituals, Tevinter obviously became the most unpopular <laughs> nation in Thetis. Andraste started her exalted march on the nation, which, along with the Blights, which were also started by a blood magic ritual gone wrong, led to its eventual downfall as well. In between the fall of Tevinter and the Chantry came various mage hunters and the First Inquisition that hunted down dangerous blood mages. With the rise of the Chantry came the rise of banning blood magic, and with the First Inquisition disbanding and throwing their force behind the Chantry to become Templars, anyone practicing blood magic outside of Deventer was largely killed, hunted down, or ran away to Deventer. Today in Thetis, blood magic is largely taboo. Even in Deventer, it's impolite to talk about, although many mages practice the art in secret. Laws against blood magic come and go in the Imperium, but apparently at the moment, the current Black Divine has lifted a lot of laws on even dreamwalking for research purposes. That being said, there are a lot of, it's not blood magic, but it's totally blood magic, out in the open, even Southern Thetis. Phylacteries, used in circles to help track a mage, is a blood magic ritual that is common practice and used daily. Necromancy, popular in Navara, is a form of blood magic, despite the mortalitasi denying this. So... In short, blood magic is illegal until it's convenient. Mechanics. How magic works is something that's usually glossed over in the series, with most answers being, because it's magic, but blood magic actually has some parameters that we have been given. First is that it's not truly just a school of magic like creation or primal, but a source of power to draw from to fuel spells, similar to the Fade and Lyrium. With that power source, however, you are able to do different things, which is where the School of Blood Magic comes in. The School of Blood Magic, which by that I'm referring to like the general study of spells that only can be achieved by blood magic and not like an actual school in Thetis that studies blood magic, uh, it isn't exactly well told to us by the players, but we can assume a couple things based on in-game abilities and events. It's said that blood magic can help a person walk the Fade with their full consciousness while allowing them to find others in the Fade at will. A blood mage can also influence and dominate the thoughts of others in the waking world. It can also be used to rip open the Fade to easily bring in demons to the world of the waking, and Celis does describe using blood magic as, like, not being able to connect to the Fade that well, and then, like, it also thins the veil, so something with the veil it doesn't like. <laughs> Many of the blood magic spells in Origins and Dragon Age 2 revolve around using health instead of mana to fuel spells, usually at a 2 to 1 ratio, along with taking health from both allies and foes and controlling foes in the battlefield for a short amount of time. They didn't actually want to do blood magic in Inquisition because they thought, like, you know, the Inquisitor being an open blood mage would not be very, uh, looked well upon. So they actually just replaced it with necromancy. Like, if you... Uh, go into the file of the Dragon Age Inquisition, most of the necromancy abilities are actually called Blood Mage abilities. <laughs> um, <laughs> and for the most part, the abilities that I just mentioned are able to do with a necromancy skill tree. Anyway, becoming a Blood Mage seems to happen in one of two ways. Either you are a mage and you meet another mage who practices blood magic and teaches you, or you are a mage that makes a deal with a demon. 
I should also say that those who learn from demons aren't always possessed either, but you like you could be possessed. It's a possibility. In Deventer, it's actually pretty common for parents to teach their children a bit of blood magic, even those that are generally against it. Another thing to bring up is that blood magic isn't quite about the blood, but rather the life force that it represents. If you were to, say, recreate blood in the lab, it would have almost no magical properties. What fuels the magic is the life force that is drained when a living being bleeds. The pain and the death is what is powerful, not really the blood, which is more of a byproduct. There does seem to be some sort of ability to conserve the life energy that was drained away into pools of blood for storage for long periods of time, but in general, the older the blood is, the less magical ability a mage is able to take from it. There is something about blood magic being able to heal the blight. In the novel Last Flight, Isia was able to draw the blight from a clutch of griffin eggs at the expense of blighting herself even more. The explanation here is that the eggs were so young, the blight had not progressed and anchored itself into the babies yet, so she was able to pull out the little bad particles into herself. Meryl, too, was able to purify a tainted alluvian, which that itself is just like a big collection of question marks to be honest uh without some strange lore being dropped in the future that would have to mean that the alluvium was made of lyrium which is plausible and that she had purified the lyrium which would also mean that she could theoretically cure red lyrium which sandal did do and that's debated if that was lore or just a fun little gag or did sandal actually do blood magic like there's a whole bunch of questions here i can't answer but speaking of blood magic in the Blight, Dragon Age Origins did introduce Avernus, who had used blood magic to extend his life far beyond that of most people. And you can unlock some special abilities for your warden that seem to be using a combo of blood magic and blight magic to create its own unique abilities, but this has never been explored in the other games or any other media since. Is it evil? The big question in Thetis that is asked time and time again, can there be ethical blood magic? The actual basics of blood magic are simple enough. You use the life energy that is contained in blood as it drains from a body to power your magic, which allows you to do spells that are not always plausible with other energy sources. This itself is not evil so long as the blood used is freely given. The problem is that a fundamental part of blood magic is the more painful the bloodletting, the more power the blood holds. So now you not only have an incentive for torturing the bloodletter, but also using someone against their will. There also seems to be a mechanic where blood magic users are more susceptible to possession by a demon, but again, not necessarily evil, just dangerous. I'm not going to sit here and talk ethics, but there is a very narrow cliff for ethical blood magic users to stand on without falling into the abyss of unethical uses and abilities. There are a lot of scenarios that turn this issue very gray very fast. My personal thoughts on the matter are best summed up in a quote from the Codex Entry of Responsible Blood Magic. You quote the example of the lovers Crescens and Seraphinian. Yes, Seraphinian offered his own blood to cure Crescens of her wasting disease, and Crescens lived a long life, but if the noblest use of blood magic still calls for the death of a good man, is that not enough reason to reconsider? Lyrium and Blood Okay, so let's jump back to that PM I mentioned. Ness asked, Just wondering your thoughts if mages use lyrium, do you think that's considered blood magic since it's the blood of a titan? I'm sure you've been bugged about this before. Uh, maybe I have, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> but you're the first one to put it in writing that I saw recently, so here you go. So, I think this actually gets back to the fact that mages don't really draw power from the blood alone, but the life energy where the blood was taken from. It would be my opinion, and the devs could obviously not agree with me here, that no, using lyrium is not a form of blood magic as old lyrium is just as powerful as freshly mined lyrium, at least in our current understanding. The power of lyrium is held within the substance itself and not in the draining of the life force of the titan. Granted, this could easily be proven wrong as perhaps the substance of lyrium just like holds the life energy better than blood does, but then you would think that lyrium would have the same abilities as blood magic, which it doesn't. Lyrium has its own advantages and abilities different from the school of blood. However, that's not to say that a blood magic adjacent ritual couldn't be performed on a titan. It may be possible that you can take too much lyrium from a titan to kill it, or perhaps even take its heart. Imagine then, if you will, the amount of magical power that is possible in using a blood magic type ritual on a large creature such as a titan in which both the draining of life and its blood, aka lyrium, held immense power. What could you do? The gross question. 
So, Ness, the question I do get a lot about blood magic isn't the cool one you <laughs> thought of. It's actually this one. But can you use period blood when doing blood magic? The short answer is that it's never really been answered by the devs. Sort of. Okay, so like when I was sitting down to do this script, I had like a vague memory of weeks answering this. And sure enough, I found a BSN comment about it. But I was never able to find where they themselves actually said this. So there is a chance that this isn't canon. But even still, Weeks basically says, I'm not sure. Uh, but they do give parameters on how it would work. So now it's time to think too hard about it. Very quickly, a period is when the lining of the uterus is built up in preparation for pregnancy. No pregnancy happens, and so the body sloughs off the extra lining. Cramps are the body's way of getting the lining out of the body, and the blood is the result of the blood that was caught in the tissue as the skin separates from the uterus. So, while cramps are painful, I don't believe that they cause the bleeding. By the time the body starts to cramp, the uterus lining has already started to break down and separate from the rest of the uterus. So it's my personal opinion that the pain of cramping would not be linked to any pain that would be useful for blood magic. Most women that menstruate do so without much overall effect on the body, but there is a small amount of women, which I think the number I saw was like one in five, so I guess larger than you think, but still not as common, have naturally heavy periods and can get anemic, meaning that there isn't enough blood in their body. This can cause these women some minor to serious side effects. I think there is an argument that these women would lose life force during their period. And with all that information, it's my honest assumption that period blood in most women would have so minor an effect that it wouldn't have a noticeable ability in blood magic. If regular blood magic was a firecracker, period blood would be a baking soda volcano. The average period could probably produce the same amount of magical power as when someone with gingivitis flosses their teeth, so it's basically useless. But rarely, very, very rarely, I think there could be a woman who could do something with it. Again, I don't think it's that many women. It might not be enough to actually do anything of substance with it, but it would at least be a little bit more noticeable. You know, it's not going to be like a lot. Maybe you could do like one quick spell and that's it. And even more rarely, there are women with cancers or other terrible medical conditions where heavy bleedings are signs of something very, very wrong with the body. That, I think, would have a decent effect with blood magic, but this also opens up the question on how various illnesses affect blood magic, which I have no information on. But I think that's the big question we need to ask here. <laughs> how would diseases of the body that's actively killing the body, like, aff like, affect blood magic? Like, if you have someone who is dying of, like, a really serious cancer, bleeding's not going to, like, do much. So they're, like, you probably need healthy slaves if you were to venture magister. And that, dear patrons, is all that we know on blood magic. Now, I know that I mentioned that necromancy is a form of blood magic and then didn't talk about necromancy at all, but considering that it seems to be something in the works of Dragon Age 4, it didn't really seem wise to talk about what little we have now when a giant flood is coming. So, if you still have lingering questions, proof that I'm wrong, comment about your own fan theory. Feel free to tweet me at, at on Twitter or send a PM to user Gillanon on Reddit. Duress Sherelle.